Hello and welcome to this series of lectures, Pharmacology Made Easy. Pharmacology is the study of drugs and drugs, as is common knowledge, is any substance used to treat, cure or prevent a disease. That is, we are talking about medicines, drugs used for the benefit of the recipient. And if this is a concept which should be uppermost in our mind, that we are using drugs for the benefit of the recipient, knowledgeable use of drugs is a must. Then what must we know before we think of prescribing a medication for the patient in front of us? Or what knowledge is required for deciding, deriving the best possible treatment for any clinical condition which presents before us in the form of the patient? Let us try to understand this with the help of Parkinsonism as the case in point. I'm sure most of you know what is Parkinsonism and maybe we'll be able to diagnose a patient who just walks into your clinic by just observing him. By observing his gait, his posture, his face, the trembling hands. So even just a look at this patient walking in could be enough for diagnosis. Some conditions you may require to take history of the patient, elicit some signs or ask for symptoms, and at times you may require investigations. But fine, if you've diagnosed the patient, is that enough to start prescribing? The background knowledge which goes on or which is involved before you can reach to a conclusion as to which drug is to be prescribed for this patient involves a lot of thinking going on. So what is this knowledge that you require? The knowledge that you require is what causes Parkinsonism? If we come back to this condition of Parkinsonism. So what causes Parkinsonism? It is a deficiency of dopamine. And where? At the corpus striatum, somewhere in the brain, the basal ganglia. So this deficiency of dopamine in the basal ganglia at the corpus striatum, which leads to all these development of all these symptoms. Fine? But then the treatment for Parkinsonism should be dopamine. That's the logical treatment. But however, some of you may know, we cannot use dopamine to treat Parkinsonism. It's not as simple as giving iron for treatment of iron deficiency anemia. And why? Because when it was realized that Parkinsonism is formed or caused due to deficiency of dopamine, obviously the logical treatment tried was dopamine, but dopamine did not show any beneficial effect in these patients of Parkinsonism. They wondered why and found out that given orally, dopamine does not reach the systemic circulation even, leave alone reaching the blood, reaching the brain. So they tried giving dopamine by intravenous route and yet there was no benefit. And it was realized that dopamine does not go into the brain because there's something called blood-brain barrier which does not permit anything and everything which is in the blood to go into the brain. What is permitted? It's only the lipid soluble drugs which have access to the brain. This is a protective, rigid blood brain barrier. So dopamine was ruled out. What did we study about dopamine? We studied whether it gives us any benefit and the actions of dopamine on the body, whether beneficial or adverse. That aspect, study of these aspects is called as pharmacodynamics. What the drug can do to the body is pharmacodynamics. In trying to understand why, we studied whether the dopamine gets into the systemic circulation. And this entry into systemic circulation is the absorption of the drug, is referred to as absorption. Giving intravenously, the drug was there in the systemic circulation, but it failed to reach the brain and its site of action. This movement of drug from the systemic circulation to its site of action is called distribution. And this is important because for producing any action or effect, the drug, drug has to reach the site of action. Not only reach there, reach there in adequate amounts and the required time frame. Okay. And so we studied that dopamine does not get absorbed, does not distribute to the site of action, and therefore 
dopamine cannot perform what we want it to do. Thus, this kinetics, the movement of the drug into systemic circulation or elsewhere, which comes under the subheading of pharmacokinetics, does influence pharmacodynamics. If the drug cannot reach its side of action, it cannot do the job that we expect it to do. Then the thought process began, if there is deficiency of dopamine, it must be reaching there somehow. And they realized that levodopa is a precursor of dopamine, which can get converted to dopamine inside the body. So when we use it as a drug, it is called a prodrug, inactive substance, getting converted into an active moiety, which will actually do the job. So they tried levodopa and it gave dramatic results. So it was realized that levodopa given orally is reaching into the blood, that is it is getting absorbed. It is going into the brain, that is it is distributed into the brain, it can cross the blood brain barrier and there it is getting converted into dopamine by the dopaminergic neurons and can replenish the deficiency and thereby give dramatic improvement of symptoms. That's fine. But then it was realized that giving levodopa did give us beneficial effects, but its use was associated with severe nausea and vomiting. Do you think understanding why a particular drug is causing a particular unwanted effect, the mechanism of this unwanted effect would also be beneficial? Yes, obviously, because as you can see, they realized that the adverse effect of nausea vomiting was because of dopamine formed in the periphery. The enzyme dopa decarboxylase, which converts levodopa to dopamine, is not only present in the brain, it is also present outside the blood-brain barrier. And 95% of the dose of levodopa that we administer is getting converted into dopamine outside the blood-brain barrier. Is this dopamine useful to the patient? Definitely not, because it doesn't go into the brain. Not only it is not useful, not only we are wasting 95% of the dose, this dopamine formed in the periphery is responsible for nausea vomiting. Now those of you know about Parkinsonism would also be knowing that though levodopa is able to relieve symptoms, we almost never use levodopa alone. Levodopa is usually combined with carbidopa. This is where there can be confusion. We discussed that levodopa is converted into dopamine by dopa decarboxylase enzyme and carbidopa is a drug which can inhibit this enzyme. It will not allow this enzyme to convert levodopa to dopamine. What is the logic in giving levodopa which you wanted to get converted into dopamine and combining it with a drug which can prevent this conversion? Obviously, they studied the pharmacokinetics of carbidopa as well. When could you use this combination? Only if carbidopa doesn't get distributed into the brain. Carbidopa doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. And therefore, it will only inhibit the unwanted peripheral conversion of levodopa to dopamine. 95% of levodopa which is getting converted, that will be prevented by carbidopa. With two benefits. One is nausea vomiting produced by dopamine formed in the periphery that is controlled. And secondly, the entire dose of levodopa is available for crossing into the brain and getting converted to dopamine where we want it. And this central conversion, the conversion in the brain is not hampered by carbidopa because it doesn't go there. And thus, the most effective treatment for Parkinsonism today, of course it has its limitations, but otherwise the most effective treatment, not levodopa alone, but it is levodopa-carbidopa combination. So have you understood that? By studying the kinetics of dopamine, absorption, distribution, both were lacking. We realized that dopamine is useless in treatment of Parkinsonism. By studying that levodopa is absorbed, distributed and biotransformed into dopamine. We realized that yes, and it is giving us clinical benefit. We realized that yes, levodopa is a drug which can help us. And then understanding the mechanism of unwanted effects of nausea vomiting and studying carbidopa. What is the dynamics of carbidopa? That it can prevent conversion of levodopa to dopamine. And what is the kinetics? It is getting absorbed on oral administration. 
but it does not cross the blood brain barrier. And therefore, we could safely combine it with levodopa to minimize the adverse effects, reduce the requirement of dose, and get better clinical benefit. Thus, we have seen that pharmacotherapeutics, that is, choosing the right drug for treatment of a particular clinical condition, has to be based on sound knowledge of pharmacokinetics as well as pharmacodynamics of the drugs available. Pharmacokinetics, the movement of the drug in the body, and pharmacodynamics, actions the drug can produce in the body, both are governed by body's rules, the general principles. And understanding these general principles, these general concepts, which govern the action and movement of drugs, commonly referred to as general pharmacology, is the essential basics for understanding and helping us to remember different drugs which are currently being used. Pharmacology is a dynamic subject and new drugs, many new drugs are added every day. A sound knowledge of these general concepts will also help us to understand any new drug we come across and weigh its worth in terms of efficacy and safety and more importantly compare it with the drugs that we already have so that we can make wise decisions wise informed decisions about the choice of drugs for our patients. So this is how the study of pharmacology should go around. We must first understand these general concepts, understand how these general concepts apply to the different drugs which are available and then come to the choice of drugs for clinical use and for that we must start with understanding the basic physiology which is being affected in that clinical condition. We should know what is causing these changes, the pathophysiology, what are the changes and what is causing it, the pathophysiology and the etiopathology. And then our background knowledge of the drugs available will help us to identify drugs which could be useful in correcting this problem. And thus we can choose the drug of choice for treatment of this clinical condition and of course also taking into consideration the attributes of the patient in front of us. And the series of lectures on fun with pharmacology will also follow this format. Thank you and welcome to see the rest of the lectures as well.